Hello and welcome to a new series on the channel called Book Club. In this series, I'll be distilling the top lessons I've learned from programming books I've read, summarizing the major takeaways from the books. This is the first of many, so be sure you're subscribed to the channel to catch the upcoming videos. To start off the series today, we'll be taking a look at The Pragmatic Programmer by David Thomas and Andrew Hunt. The book originally came out in 1999 and was so influential that it was used as a textbook to teach specific university courses. The second edition of the book, which is what I have here, was released in 2019 for the 20th anniversary of the book. It has a lot more context, seeing as a lot has changed between 1999 and now. The book has been dubbed one of the most influential books on programming of all time. It doesn't present a systematic theory, but instead has a collection of tips to improve the software development process in a pragmatic way, guiding you along your journey to mastery. It's years of valuable software development lessons condensed into a very digestible book, with topics ranging from investing in your knowledge, testing your code, debugging, and much more. With that being said, here are five lessons that stood out to me that are worth sharing. The first lesson is titled, The Cat Ate My Source Code. For this lesson, the book talks about taking responsibility for yourself and your actions in terms of career advancement, learning and education, projects, and day-to-day -day work. Things go wrong even in the most thought out, properly planned and engineered project. Unforeseen technical problems arise and when they do, you should step in and deal with them as professionally as possible. This means being honest and direct. When you make an error, step up and own it. The book states, we can be proud of our abilities, but we must also own up to our shortcomings, our ignorance, and our mistakes. It's not the most pleasant feeling, but doing so will lead your team and your customers to trust you a lot more. They also gave a great lesson that I learned from one of my mentors sometime last year. It's the idea of providing options and not making lame excuses. Whenever you're in a situation where you have to give unfavorable news about something, provide options along with the unfavorable news. Say a situation isn't going according to plan. Before you go back to your supervisor and say, hey, this is not working, have options for a way to move forward. If you're asked to implement a feature that you know is not possible, don't just turn it down. Give options or alternate ways to achieve a similar outcome. You've probably seen this in action at a restaurant. When you try to order something that isn't available, a good waiter doesn't just tell you it's unavailable. They provide options and similar alternatives, making it easy for you to decide. Providing options shows that you're thinking one step ahead and softens the impact of the negative news that you're delivering. The next lesson that stood out to me was the idea of software entropy. For this lesson, the authors compared a code base to a building. Researchers in crime and urban decay discovered that the difference between a well-kept intact building and a smashed abandoned building is a broken window. Once the window is left unrepaired for a substantial amount of time, it instills a sense of abandonment for the inhabitants of the building, showing that the people who own the building do not care about it. Another window gets broken and soon, the building goes from looking like this to looking like this. Here's a quote from the book. Don't leave broken windows, bad design, wrong decision, or poor code unrepaired. Fix each one as soon as it is discovered. If there's insufficient time to fix it properly, then board it up. Perhaps you can put a comment on the offending code or display a not implemented message or substitute dummy data instead. Take some action to prevent further damage and show that you're on top of the situation. People working on a project, especially folks new to it, tend to copy code snippets from one part of the project and paste it in another when implementing a new feature or fixing a bug. If that code was good enough for that part of the project, then it should be good enough here. If the original snippet they copied has a bad design, you can see how you can end up with a code base full of bad code. Whenever you see a broken window, Fix it before it spreads. Don't call it tech debt. You probably won't have enough time to get back to it. The next lesson is about communication. As developers, communication is a big part of our job, but many developers are not quite good at communicating. Having the best ideas, the finest code, or the most pragmatic thinking is ultimately sterile unless you can communicate it with others. Most developers are good at communicating the technical stuff with other developers, but tend to drop the bar when speaking with non-developers. Here are a few tips outlined in the book that can help. The first is to know what you want to say. Plan it out and have a written outline of the major points you want to come across. The second is to know your audience. Ask yourself the following questions using the WISDOM acronym. What does your audience want? What is their interest? How sophisticated are they? How much detail do they want? Who do you want to own the information? And finally, how can you motivate them to listen? Answering these questions are vital and will help you communicate effectively with whoever you're talking to. Tech companies like Apple, for example, have conferences every year. They have one for regular people who use their product and a completely different one for developers. The content and delivery for both are different because the answers to the six questions I posed earlier are completely different for both audiences. Communication is both about what you say and the way you say it. 
Let's move on to some technical lessons. The next lesson is about the principle of dry, short for don't repeat yourself. As programmers, we collect, organize, maintain, and harness knowledge. We document the knowledge and specifications and make it come alive in code. The reality is most of that knowledge is unstable. It changes rapidly. The understanding of a requirement may change following a meeting with a client. The government constantly changes regulations and some business logic needs to be updated. All this instability means we spend much of our time in maintenance mode, reorganizing the code within our systems. It is easy to duplicate knowledge within our systems, making it harder for us to maintain it. The solution to this is to use the dry principle. The quote from the book states, every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation within a system. Here's an example directly taken from the book that shows this principle in action. Let's take a look at this block of code. It's a simple function that's supposed to print the account balances for an account. The first thing it does is print the account debits and credits. If the account fees are less than zero, it prints a negative sign followed by the account fees. And if the account fees are not less than zero, it prints the account fees. It then prints a blank line and does the same for the account balance. If the balance is negative, it prints the negative value of the account balance. And if it's not, it prints the account balance. There are three examples of duplication in this code. The first is a duplication of handling negative numbers. We can fix that by adding this function that takes the value and prints a specific sign based on the value. Our print balances function will then look like this, where we call our new function to handle the formatting of the values. This way, any changes related to formatting all values will only happen in one place. There is another duplication in the repetition of the field with the printf call. We can fix this by using our existing function, giving us this. The format account function will also print the account debits and credits, making all print statements uniform and leading to future changes in only one spot. What if the client asks for an extra space between the labels and the numbers? With this, we'd have to change five lines. We can remove this duplication by creating a function report line that takes in two values, the label and the amount. It then calls a new function that does the formatting, print line. The final print balances now looks like this. If we want to change the formatting, we can change it in only one place, the format amount function. And if we want to change the label format, we change only the report line function. This is a great example of how to avoid duplication of logic in code. Any logic repeated more than once should be wrapped in a function. This makes maintaining and reusing the code a lot easier. The book also goes into other types of duplication, like duplication in documentation, duplication in data classes, and a lot more. They also have examples like this that make it easy to understand. The final lesson is about testing. Of all the coding concepts I've learned, testing took me the longest time to grasp because I wasn't used to doing it. It was never enforced in college and testing was the last thing on my mind when I worked on personal projects. My perspective then was if the code worked, it worked. No need to spend extra time writing tests to confirm what I already know. My stance on that has obviously changed as I've gone through scenarios and experiences that have helped me understand the importance of testing. The book recommends treating test cases as the first users of our code and states that testing also gives us vital feedback that guides our coding. A function or method tightly coupled to other code is hard to test because you have to set up a lot before you can even run the test. Making your code testable means reducing the coupling leading to cleaner code. Before you can test something, you also have to understand it. We've all been in situations writing code where a function is starting to look a little bit longer than it should. Deep down, we know we should probably split it into multiple functions, but we convince ourselves that it'll all make sense in the end. The function might work, but testing it properly will be a nightmare. Let's take our print account balance, for example. Unit testing the logic behind each function is way easier. We can develop more test cases for each smaller function and test the code more robustly. If we think about how we will test the code while writing the code, we end up writing cleaner, more maintainable code. Those are my top lessons. There's a lot more valuable information in this book, and it was tough to narrow them down to these five. The lessons I spoke about only skimmed the surface on some of the chapters. For example, the chapter on testing went into test-driven development, a very important concept in the current era of software development. I'll leave a link to the book down below the like button if you want to pick it up. If you can access a public library, they may also have a copy you can rent for free. I picked up this copy from the Seattle library and getting it was a lot easier than I thought it would. That's it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, then consider subscribing. Thanks for watching and catch you on the next one. Until then, happy coding. Peace.